All right, Virginia Woolf, arguably the most famous British female writer of all time. Probably Jane Austen, um, you know, would give uh, her a run for her money, probably. But uh, definitely of this era, the most famous, I believe, British writer of this era. Um, but all time, probably right up there with uh, Jane Austen as the most famous. So very influential. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, her contributions and such, but uh, a, a lot of her tones in her writing, um, you know, had a little bit of a darker nature. If anybody knows anything ab about her, um, you know, she had a few stints in uh, her depression, uh, you know, in, in uh, not necessarily a nursing home, but not necessarily being committed to an institution, but she went to some place to kind of decompress a little bit, a handful of times. Uh, the deaths of her uh, parents really set her off. Um, there were times in her life where she was so depressed that she wasn't able to write. Um, and for a person whose occupation centers around writing, that could be a bit of a, an obstacle to get around, especially if they make their living that way. Um, you know, uh, uh, there is uh, our book talks about uh, you know her her death. Uh, it doesn't go into so much about how she died, just that her body was found in a river. Um, but uh, it, it's widely believed, speculated, and. Uh, you know, the followers of her believe that it was suicide uh, that she uh, walked into the river and, and drowned uh, because she was so, uh, so depressed in her life. One of her big contributions of the era uh, was the style with which she wrote her work. If you uh, noticed in our introductory material, it talks about revolutionizing fiction. Up until now, it was always focused on, you know, the plot structure, the plot diagram, triangle, or whatever terminology we, you know, we've had over the years. Um, where it starts with, you know, the exposition introduced to the main setting and characters. And then we have the building up of rising action to the climactic and then the resolution. So it's the typical structure of any big story or short story. Well, with her, it was much different. She kind of threw that out the window. And it, hers is more of the phrase stream of consciousness, where it's just she has a thought, just like we all have thoughts, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on and then it wraps up. And we'll see a great example of that in the story in a little bit. Um, some of the examples it talks about in the introductory information talks about a, a piece called uh, Jacob's Room, which tells the story of a young man's life entirely through an examination of his room. So she came up with this fiction where she walked around this person's room and by looking at all of the details, kind of constructed a person and constructed a, a persona and a life of that particular individual. And in doing so, there isn't any plot. There isn't any rising action and climax. It's just looking around, kind of like a Sherlock Holmesian approach, where you're finding all this evidence and what kind of person would live in this. What kind of story could we come up with this particular person? Um, and so that it was very revolutionary at the time. Uh, the piece we're going to focus on in a, in a little bit is called Shakespeare's Sister, where she hypothetically says, you know, I don't think women of that era if Shakespeare had a sister, if Shakespeare were a clone, but, but a woman, that she could have been as successful as him because women weren't given that opportunity. Um, and she, she is definitely a, a, a beacon of uh, feminism uh, in the modern <coughs> times. And by showcasing this uh, Shakespeare sister in the past, uh, you're able to really show how women were not equal. And some might argue now women still aren't looked upon as equal, but I would argue that it's far better than what it was in Shakespeare's time and hopefully each generation gets better and better and better and more equal for not just all races but all genders. So with Shakespeare's sister, uh, if you go ahead and turn to the beginning of this particular story, it's just a few pages ahead here, um, on, in our textbook it's on 1202, we will see a, a number of issues we've already spoken about her. Uh, we will see the role of uh, the feminist uh, talking about historically how women were treated and in, in a, almost in a complete vacuum how women would not be able to have um, you know, the same opportunities even if they were as skilled as him just because of their gender. Um, and uh, she argues that they should be, well I think we can all agree, I hope, that uh, women should have the same opportunities uh, if they are equally skilled or superior to the men and not just held back because of their uh, their uh, uh, gender. So uh, on this particular piece, uh, we will see that this is one of those examples of that stream of consciousness where she starts off, and if you look on this page, she starts off just curious, I wonder what would have happened if if Shakespeare were a woman. Well, if you wonder, well, what if he had a sister? Let's just make her up a name, Judith. What if Judith 
we're as skilled as him. And then as you look uh, about midway through this page, a, a good chunk of this uh, page is like, well, Shakespeare, he had all of these opportunities and he had this skill set. Okay, well, if she were a woman, what would that have looked like? What would that, uh, for Judith, what would that experience have been like? Notice in looking at the two pages, it's just one big paragraph, the stream of consciousness. You will see at the very end with a finale that comes back and she says, yeah, that's what I think probably would happen if Shakespeare had a sister that was equally talented. And so we start the thought and we end the thought and here it's just kind of a, I don't want to say a daydream, but it's kind of similar to that. A well-organized daydream as it flows uh, from beginning to end and it's all just one thought. So it's a great example of that stream of consciousness that we talked about and how she revolutionized fiction. We see the, the uh, thematic um, you know, of uh, feminism in here, the thematic elements, and we also see that uh, darkness that she had in her life where it's almost uh, a surprise uh, twist at the end. It's just like, oh, wow, that got dark really fast. Uh, so go ahead and follow along. Uh, we are on 1202, uh, Shakespeare's Sister. Shakespeare's sister, uh, we see right back at the beginning, it says that it would have been impossible completely and entirely for any woman to have written a plays of Shakespeare in the age of Shakespeare. And she even says in there that the bishop is right. So maybe even they're, they're preaching the fact that women are incapable of being the equal of men in that time. But you know what, I'm thinking about it, and uh, I think it would be. Not that she would be... Uh, uh, incapable of producing the same literature, but that she wouldn't be given the opportunity is the key, I think, to show here. Um, and again, being a, a modern feminist writer that she was, she was really pushing the cause. Of, and so if you look down uh, uh, that middle area there where it talks about Shakespeare, about how he was given all of these opportunities, a little bit of his history and what it was like, maybe a little bit of an embellishment uh, here and there, but this is what life was like back then for him. Okay, a very famous and obviously very successful uh, playwright. But still today, he's the most produced uh, playwright every single year around the world. Um, and this guy's been dead since 1616, so it's quite interesting. Coming up on 400 years in a couple years, um, and he's still so, so popular. So, um, uh, but that last portion of this page, it, it talks about that she would not have been sent to school like him to learn. If she were reading, they would have told her, no, go back into the kitchen, work on the stew. Here, try this, uh, you know, handiwork. This thing needs some sewing. This is where the woman's place is. And it's not that her family, which was very loving and, and well off, it's not like they were treating her like Cinderella with the wicked stepsisters. They love her. It said she was probably, or would probably have been, the apple of her father's eye. They all loved her, but that's just what the women would do. But the women would be married off. Uh, you know, they, they wouldn't have the opportunity to fall in love. It was just prearranged marriages. And she wasn't going to have that, so what would Shakespeare's uh, sister have done? She would have snuck out of the house and run off. And she would have shown up in London. She would have shown up at the theaters because she loves the performance. And the managers would have been, oh, there's no way women are going to be on stage. Ha, 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 how silly. And then if you look at, uh, right around the middle, it says that uh, she had a taste for theater a couple lines down. No woman, he said, could possibly be an actress. He hinted, well, you could imagine what. Okay, so she could get no training in her craft. So, so alluding to maybe he propositioned her because that's what women, you know, with no money, you know, would have done. And so when she says, I can't walk around at midnight, I can't go to restaurants late by myself, probably because she would have been accosted. Um, you wouldn't have been protected. So it wasn't a great age for women, even skilled women. And wanting to be passionate and have her and refine her craft, she can't find the training. So you can imagine the depression that would set in. Now she did eventually get married and uh, she had a child or was pregnant and it looks like she just kind of settled. But, but if you just settle and you never do what you really want to do, you never have that true happiness. And so then maybe it wasn't a shit for you, but it was a surprise to me, the very end there, which says that she killed herself one winter's night. To me, that kind of came out of nowhere. Um, but if we connect it back to what we know about Virginia Woolf from our discussion a little bit ago, very dark, 
uh, bipolar, uh, supposedly killed herself. Now, she didn't write this post killing herself, but if she had those thoughts, obviously wouldn't those show up into her very personable writings and help you know, really show how women didn't have the opportunities and some women maybe did do that. Um, and then I like really like that last line. Yeah, that's probably what would have happened if Shakespeare had a sister. It starts with that idea and it ends with as if the finality of, yeah, I think that's what would have happened. Hmm, interesting. And so in between, it's that stream of consciousness. So it's a great example. Shakespeare's Sister is a wonderful example of an uh, introduction, brief introduction to Virginia Woolf. It showcases that feminism, okay? Shows you the darkness connection of her life and how that shows up in here, okay? That, that's huge. And then that, like I said, the stream of consciousness. So that's big, big two, three things, okay?